22 different offensive line combinations so far this year. That is the most in the NFL. That's part of the trouble they've had. They've given up 46 sacks, eight more than any other team in the league. And under all of that pressure, their quarterback, Carson Wentz, is throwing the ball to receivers who aren't open. According to our next-gen stats, Wentz has tallied 78 tight window throws this year, second most in the league. And so not surprisingly, all of that doesn't end well. Wentz has thrown four more picks than any other quarterback. Here's Coach Doug Peterson on the state of his QB. The struggles we had last night weren't, weren't from the quarterback position. It was, it was a bunch of mistakes from, from all positions that caused us to not be as successful. But, but as far as the rotation goes, you'd like to be in a little more, more of a rhythm. If it were Jalen in there, maybe he goes a couple plays in a row. You know, and obviously if Carson's in there, he takes the bulk of the action. They're both professionals. They understand and, and um, they expect nothing, uh, nothing less. Okay, so that was a lot of words. Uh, Dominique Foxworth, what? I don't know. It seems like he's gotten worse at during press conferences. His press conference last week was kind of a shame. <laughs> it's even less sense. It feels like he's like a lawyer, like a defense attorney for a criminal who we all watched commit the crime, and he's trying to convince us that he did. <laughs> we saw Carson Wentz throw that ball right to the defense. Like, we saw it. We saw him out there doing nonsense, so I agree. He didn't get a ton of help, but we watched him. I mean, the glove fits. We got to be honest with ourselves and say that Carson Wentz is not playing well. And the nonsense about we got to get a guy in a rhythm. You don't get a guy in a rhythm by throwing one player out there for one play. Like, to me, that feels like he doesn't, he doesn't want to play Jalen Hurts. But somebody higher up in the organization, and I'm not reporting this, obviously. It's just my speculation. It feels like someone higher in the organization than him said, play Jalen Hurts. And he was like, all right, I'm going to show them. I'm putting him out there for one play. See, I played him. Take that. Like, it doesn't seem like it's something that he really believes in and he wants to make happen. And it's just a mess right now. I'll say this. While that sounds crazy, I can think of no better explanation, Ryan Clark, for throwing Jalen Hurts onto the field, having him play one play, running exactly the same play you might have run with Carson Wentz and running him back off the field. I don't have a better explanation for how they are handling their quarterback situation right this minute. Listen, Dom seems seems dead on. He seems to have, cre- have created a narrative that makes us believe it. He kind of reminds me of the late, great Johnny Cochran and what he's doing <laughs> right now because I never even thought of that. I never even thought of, like, you know what? Let me show you, executives. You wanted to get this guy. You think Carson should be out? I'm going to put him on the field. I'm going to do something that we could do with Carson anyway, and then I'm going to say Carson can do it better. But then when you get into the press conference and you start to fumble over your words, you kind of don't have a direction in what you're saying. It it lets me know that you weren't prepared for this. There was only one other person in the world who loved Carson Wentz as much as Doug Peterson coming into this season, and that's Dan Orlowski. And no matter what Carson Wentz has done, we haven't been able to create, we haven't been able to convince Dan that he can't play. No matter what he's what he's done, he hasn't been able to convince Doug Peterson that he can't play. So Doug Peterson is still believing that Carson Wentz is his guy, and I truly think he doesn't think Jalen Hurts is. And so now when you ask him this question, because he can look at the evidence. He's looking at the evidence. He's standing in front of the jury and he knows my guy is wrong. But he's saying to himself, but they guy ain't right. And so now he's trying to figure out a way to talk around himself, to say that they're both professionals, to say a lot of words that mean nothing. He's doing his best Jerry Jones impression because he has no idea where to go with this because in a million years, you couldn't have told him that Carson Wentz was this quarterback and he was totally unprepared. Yeah, and I've got to be honest with you, that makes sense too. And a lot of us, including me, are surprised by how badly Wentz has played. So, Desmond, let me come to you. Of course, you cover the college game for us primarily, and you saw all of Jalen Hurts at Alabama and at Oklahoma. What is your sense of it? What was your sense of him coming in and what he can do now in whatever role they put him in in Philly? Well, Greeny, it was obvious that Jalen Hurst wasn't drafted to come in there as a starting quarterback, and no one expected him to start this season. Um, You know, you got Carson Wentz at the quarterback position. Now, he's a guy you would assume they were going to have a couple of packages for him. I had made this comment before about Doug Peterson is a really um, great offensive-minded coach, and he's going to come up with some schemes, packages to get Jalen Hurst on the field, but not the guy who you want to replace Carson Wentz as a starter. So, and I think that... You saw him fumble over his words because 
he doesn't believe what he's saying to you because he knows he's in between <laughs> a rock and a hard place in Philly right now with his guy who's not performing up to par. And then you got this, this rookie who people want to see, but you know he's not ready yet. So now you put him out there in front of the yep. press and he has to do this press conference knowing that, man, well, what can I say? I can't say this about, about Hurts because he's our high draft pick and they want to play him. But I don't want to kill my guy Carson, even though he's out there killing himself with his performance. So then as a head coach <laughs> who has empathy for your quarterback, because don't forget, Doug Peterson is a former NFL quarterback, too. Now he's just emotionally strained about how should he answer these, these questions and have some sort of um, empathy and sympathy for what's going on with his quarterback without throwing his quarterback under the bus. Like the guy said, Hey, the tape don't lie. We see how Curse is playing, man. He's throwing the ball to the other team <laughs> as if they're on his team. So Doug is just in a, in a tough position right now. And that's why he fumbled over his words the way he did in that post-game uh, post press conference. Nick, quickly, how does this end? You're the one who started it, so you tell me how it ends. We know Wentz is back. The, the contract says Wentz isn't going anywhere. He's their quarterback next year. So you got Hurts sitting there. You got Peterson coaching him. How does all this end? Yeah, I don't think it ends any differently than it starts. Like, I don't suspect any major changes. I don't think Hurts is the long-term answer going forward. They're not going to move on from Doug Peterson, who's brought them a Super Bowl after having this one disappointing season. And, and last year was riddled with injuries, just like this season. I think they end up with Wentz and Peterson uh, for one more season. And then if it, they don't turn around then, then they start making some changes. So I suspect that we hit, get a whole bunch more of the same coming up for the Eagles. All right, much more NFL as we continue with this crew of guys. Stay close by, but we got to get to the college because last night we had the second edition of the college football playoff rankings, and the top seven teams remained unchanged. Alabama, Notre Dame, Clemson, Ohio State continue to be the top four. Bama maintaining its number one spot after a 29-point win in the Iron Bowl Saturday without their coach, Nick Saban. So they couldn't be more impressive. Same top six. As we look here, Texas A&M, Florida being the two first ones out. All six teams take on unranked opponents in their next games. Five of those will be on the road, so we'll see where it goes. It was, it was a busy day yesterday, and there was a lot of things to pay attention to, even if um, nothing really moved around at the very top. And so to explain it all, Heather and Paul and Des with us as well. Heather, here's, quickly I want to start with this, because I'm sure a lot of fans saw the news that the ACC – canceled a bunch of games. They announced a bunch of schedule changes, and, and people may not understand fully why they did that. Can you explain what it means? Sure. Everyone's talking about Notre Dame and Clemson, but we have to remember Miami is also in the mix. So the ACC said, look, we're going to evaluate these three teams based on a nine-game schedule. Miami still has one more game to play to reach that mark. And at the end of the day, what it does is it frees up December 12th to make up games from this weekend if Notre Dame, Clemson, Miami are not able to play. That's basically one more Saturday of a cushion for those three teams in contention. But Notre Dame has already locked up a spot in the ACC championship game. Clemson can do the same on Saturday with a win against Virginia Tech. Paul, what do you think of it? Very smart. Uh, John Swafford, the commissioner of the ACC, showed that you have to be flexible. I'm talking to you, Kevin Warren of the Big Ten. You can't just make, make the rules and stick with them in 2020. You have to be able to move. And what he's done, Greeny, is very transparent. He has ticketed Notre Dame and Clemson uh, to the ACC championship game, which is a de facto play-in game. If Notre Dame wins, they're in. If Notre Dame loses close, they're also in, as well as Clemson. And he's giving those two the day off on December 12th while everyone else is playing, especially Alabama and Florida. Florida's supposed to play LSU that day. Alabama's supposed to play Arkansas. The games don't mean anything in terms of the, uh, the, the, conference play, the, the college football playoff. Uh, so the ACC is, is being very wise, very judicious, and saying to everyone else, we're taking the day off getting ready for the playoffs. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of people saw that news yesterday. That's a great explanation. Now, Desmond, let me come to you on this. <clears throat> the big story will be Ohio State going forward. Ohio State's sitting at number four still, still only having played four games, and their game this weekend remains sort of in the balance. What is your sense of what should happen with the Buckeyes as this thing goes forward? If they're able to play six games, then I think it's a no-brainer. Now, they're going to play Michigan State. It seems like they're going to play Michigan State 
this Saturday. Um, I really don't know how that's going to happen, but it just seems that everything is trending in that direction. So that'll be game number five for them. And then even if they don't play Michigan, let's say they don't play Michigan, there's still the Wisconsin game that people are pointing at that they can play, um, I guess, when they're playing, when the Big Ten Championship game is going on, that will give them six games. So if I had to judge Ohio State right now, though, Greeny, with their four games that they've won, they've only played against one team with a competitive pulse, and that was Indiana. And that game was in, in Columbus, and Indiana gave them all they could handle. And Ohio State didn't look that good. As a matter of fact, it was the worst we've seen Justin Fields look as a quarterback at Ohio State. So when you judge their strength of schedule too, Greeny, their strength of schedule is the worst of any of the top 10 teams right now. The worst. They're 77. But Barter, Gary Barter, the uh, spokesman for the College Football Playoff Selection Committee, continuously tells Reese Davis and that crew on Tuesday nights that BYU, that they're so low because of their strength of schedule. So there's some inconsistency there as far as the College Football Playoff Selection Committee is, is, um, is concerned. When you're looking at Ohio State over here, but then you're looking at BYU over here, over there, and you're talking about strength of schedule. So I would say right now, just by the eye test, Greeny, they're not one of the top four teams in the country. I think that Texas A&M is playing very well right now, but the Florida Gators, their offense is extremely hot, a lot of weapons, and their quarterback is probably the front runner, or he's in the hunt right now to be the front runner for the Heisman Trophy. So that's how I would look at Ohio State today, Greeny. Heather, let's compare.